guys. Good evening. It's nice to see you tonight. Nice to have you here with us. Um, Grace is going to be having baptism tomorrow morning. So <laughs> we've got the uh, baptismal here and ready to go. So we're going to work our way around it. Um, it is full, so stay away from it. Um, as I told Mike today, if anybody falls in, we just have a great story to tell. That's right. Um, so, but we will uh, just steer clear. And when kids get here, keep them away from it. Um, so, but it's great to have you guys here with us tonight. Chris is going to come now and he is going to uh, read our opening scripture for us. Chris, thank you very much. Therefore, holy brethren, who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, the apostle and high priest, whom we confess. He was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. Jesus had been found worthy of a greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of a house has greater honor than the house itself. For every house is built by somebody, but God is the builder of everything. Moses was faithful as a servant in all of God's house, testifying to what would be said in the future. But Christ is faithful as a son over God's house, and we are his house. If we hold on to our courage and hope of which we, are, of which we boast. So as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the day of rebellion during the time of testing in the desert, where your fathers tested and tried me and for 40 years saw what I did. That is why I was angry with that generation. And I said, their hearts are always going astray and they have not known my ways. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. See to it brothers, that none of you has a sinful unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly till the end of the confidence that we had at first. As he has just been said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Who were they who heard, heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the desert? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Amen. Jesus, you are the center. Jesus, we welcome you here. Jesus, you are the focus of all our praise. Jesus, you are the center. Jesus, we honor you here. Jesus, you are the promise. 
promise, Jesus, you are the prize, Jesus, you are the center of our hearts, Eli, Jesus, you are the promise, Jesus, you are my pride, Jesus, you are the center of our hearts, Give us to 
of the evil one, all with your own blood. And mercies before and behind you, such beauty all around. And how could I ever repay you but with the fragrance of my hallelujah, 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 hallelujah.
Enthroned in glory, my Savior King, your loving kindness has welcomed me. Though I'm unworthy of majesty, you wrap the lowly in royalty. So I will. Lay my crown down at your feet. You are holy, so holy, and I give my life as an offering. You are worthy, so worthy, Lord. Here at your altar to seek your faith, broken and poured out without restraint. In full abandon before my King, here I surrender my everything. So I will lay my crown down at your feet. You are holy, so holy, and I will give my life as an offering. You are worthy, so worthy. And I will lay my crown down at your feet. You are holy, so holy, and I will give my life as an offering. You are worthy, so worthy, Lord. Holy, holy, holy is the Lamb upon the throne. We join with all of heaven in 
upon the throne. We join with all the heaven in the everlasting song. Holy, holy, holy is the Lamb upon the throne. We join with all the heaven in the everlasting song. Holy, 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 holy. You are holy. You are holy, so holy, Lord. You are worthy. You are worthy, so worthy, Lord. You are holy. You are holy, so holy, Lord. You are worthy. You are worthy, so worthy, Lord. You are holy. You are holy, so holy, Lord. <laughs> The Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. Behold the man. Behold the man upon the cross. My sin upon his shoulder. Ashamed I hear my mouth. All out among the scoffers, it was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath. 
I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no Apostle Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls, compels us. Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh. We regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, 
who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight, not just for Jesus. We thank you that Jesus is our Redeemer. We thank you that he is our Reconciler. We thank you that he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But we thank you tonight, God, and I pray that you would burn and impress upon our hearts tonight the reality that he did not come just to forgive. He came to give us this ministry of reconciliation. He came not only to bear our sin, to be our sin, but to give us his righteousness. And so tonight, God, in our time together, may we not only focus on where we have been, may we concentrate on who you are calling us to be. May we be conformed to the image of Jesus. May it not be enough for us to not be what we once were. May we long to be what we are promised to be. And so tonight, Lord Jesus, thank you for making us clean. Now make us whole. Thank you for emptying us. Now fill us up. Thank you for bringing us back. Now bring us all the way in. May we be a people who... Don't just say that we have been brought out. May we know that there is a place, there is a seat, there is a table for us. May we be seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. May we be seated at our Father's table, made brand new by the blood of Jesus, by the cross and his resurrection, by the truth, the truth that he who knew no sin became sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. Tonight, may we not, may it not be enough to be saved from hell. May we want, may we long, may we hunger and thirst to be full of righteousness, to be like Jesus so that we can be with Jesus. Be glorified in us so that you can be glorified through us. Thank you tonight for the cross. Thank you tonight for the resurrection. Thank you tonight for the coming ascension. Thank you that Jesus is coming. And thank you that our place in him is secure. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, guys. You can be seated. Thank you. Noah's going to come now and lead us in our intercession. Thank you, Noah. I have to make sure. Hello? Okay, good. I had to make sure that I don't go too crazy in there, so I might end up in the water, so I might have to take a step back. But uh, good evening, everybody. Um, so tonight, I'm going to be leading inter intercession in the spirit of Easter weekend. We're going to be focusing, um, our focus is going to be twofold. First, going to be for the people that will be preaching or bringing the word this Easter Sunday, that they'd be speaking the truth, that they would be speaking a message that will impact those that are in the audience. And second, for those that are in the audience across the world, um, we're going to be praying that it for those that may come just on the holidays, just for the Christmas and Easter, um, that these people would hear a message that uh, is life altering, that is transformational, that opens their eyes. Uh, before we get to praying, though, I did want to mention uh, this Thursday a, a great example of what I, you know, will be praying for this Thursday for Monday Thursday. A few of us gathered at Tom and Joanne's house. And we, you know, we had communion um, and we read a couple passages relating to Christ's death and resurrection. And one of the things that Miss Joanne was talking about specifically was how when Christ is on the cross and he says, um, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which is a point that many skeptics and naysayers might point to to point at the lack of divinity for Christ, the lack of um, God, the Father's sovereignty over Christ's death. Um, is really not a complaint to God, but it is a pointing back to Psalm 22. Um, so before I pray, I wanted to read Psalm 22, that the uh, 
the truth that is expressed through this would be the kind of truth that those that may not know the gospel yet would come to know that that which is not formally known to those that not that don't believe would be known to them i'm reading from the niv psalm 22. <clears throat> my god my god why have you forsaken me why are you so far from saving me so far from my cries of anguish my god i cry out by day but you do not answer by night but i find no rest Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In you our ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast on you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me. Strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. Roaring lions that tear their prey open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It is melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue sticks to the root of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and glow over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. But you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him, for dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive, posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your sovereignty. We thank you for your providence. We thank you that this day, the coming up, this this holy week that we remember is a time that we can reflect on your, your great plan and the great sacrifice you gave to us for our sake. Lord, I thank you that all throughout your word is, is truth and is prophecies that are revealed over and over again. I thank you that you used your word to show us that your son didn't believe that you hid your face from him, but instead he reflected on your word and gave us a reminder of how you hide your face from none of us. So Lord, on this weekend, I just pray that you wouldn't hide your face from those that don't know you, that you would continue to reveal yourself like you already are, but that you would use those that are speaking from pulpits all across the world to preach a message that is full of truth, that is full of uh, a message that will save the lives of those that are in the audience. I pray for those that only come to church on these special holidays because their family wants them to or so that they can enjoy a nice meal afterward. And I pray that eyes and that were formerly closed would be opened and ears that were formerly deaf would be able to hear, Lord. I pray that the same message that is preached every week and every day across the world would impact the lives of those that have formerly closed themselves off to you. Lord, I just thank you again for the sacrifice that you gave to us in sending your son. And I just thank you for, for Jesus and for what he means to all of us and to all that, know, that don't know him yet, Lord. I just pray that you would show them, that you would just show them Jesus in his entirety, that you would show them you in your entirety, Lord. I just thank you for, for this week and for what it means to us. But I just thank you that you give us the opportunity to show how much it should mean to all. 
And so again, Lord, I just pray that you would have your hand on those that are speaking, that you would have your hand on those that are attending, just as you always do. But I pray that especially for those that don't know you and are just here for the sake of it, that you would use this time to, to impact them, that it would be a, a moment that they wouldn't forget. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's take a couple minutes and greet each other. If you see somebody you don't know, introduce yourself. If you see somebody you do know, welcome them. Let's take a couple minutes, move around, and uh, we'll come back together in just a couple minutes.
couple of quick announcements as you make your way back to your seats. Um, just a reminder, tomorrow morning we will be um, at the Burlington Waterfront at 7 a.m. for the community uh, sunrise service. You're welcome to join us. And then uh, Broad Street United Methodist Church always provides a, uh, a wonderful breakfast and a great time of fellowship right after. So you're, uh, you're welcome to join us for that. A um, couple of other just small little things. So out in the, in the foyer for all the men, um, Brothers in Fellowship, our men's uh, monthly men's group, um, we start a new book in April. So the new book is out there. Uh, feel free to grab one. We're asking for a $10 donation, but if you don't have 10 bucks, just take one. Um, and we will uh, figure that out along the way because the plan is, I believe, David, is to actually start the first chapter here in April. So our second Friday. So take it and start reading it. Um, and so and uh, if you're not in men's group, please don't take one until we make sure the men's group gets them. And then you're welcome to the leftovers. Cheryl, exactly. Cheryl, just leave it. Um, but. Along those lines, on that back table where uh, Amanda always has the sweatshirts, there are a bunch of free books. So basically, for those that don't know, um, we're starting construction on our house this week as my mom's preparing to move in with us. And so that means a lot of closets and cabinets have been cleaned out. And I found a bag of extra books, uh, books from Bible studies and Advent uh, devotions and stuff that we had. So they're all on the table. Take them. Give them away if you've already got them. If you want to read them, read them and give them to somebody else. I just don't want to take them home with me. Um, because if they go home with me, the vets are picking them up on Monday. Um, so, other, so take them, enjoy them, and, uh, and, and uh, again, pass them out. If you know somebody that might enjoy them, uh, take them. Stock up for Advent next year and uh, Christmas presents, all that good stuff. So I, I think that's all the announcements. The new calendar is out there. Grab that and, uh, so that you know exactly where we are and, uh, and what we're doing. So at this point, if you would turn to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. Chris did a great job reading the whole chapter for us to get us started tonight. Um, I'm going to go back and we're going we're gonna to focus on verses 12 through 19 tonight. So Hebrews chapter 3, starting in verse 12, says, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? But to those who were disobedient. And let's really focus on verse 19. So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Heavenly Father, thank you tonight for your word. Lord, as we gather to celebrate your son, thank you for your word. Thank you that the living word is revealed through the written word. Thank you for your spirit who lives in us. Holy Spirit, thank you for breathing the scriptures to those who wrote them. Thank you that you now live in us. Tonight, open our ears, open our hearts, open our minds, and lead us. Not just to read or to hear. Lead us to believe. Lead us to understand, and most of all, lead us to obey. Holy Spirit, teach us your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hebrews chapter 3 begins with this call, consider Jesus. The Greek word that's used there means to observe fully, to behold, consider, discover, or perceive. Different translations say, fix your thoughts on Jesus. Think carefully about Jesus and set your focus on Jesus. See, that's the whole purpose of the biblical festivals, right? God knows we're a forgetful people. And so not only did he give us the word, but then also he gave Israel several times a year to celebrate, to remember, to grab hold of what he had done for them, that they would remember who they were. That's also the purpose of Holy Week. 
And while Jesus is supposed to be at the center of our lives every moment of every day, these are times when that focus is meant to be intensified. On Thursday, we remembered the Last Supper. Jesus washing the disciples' feet, serving the Passover meal, comforting the troubled hearts of his disciples, wrestling and interceding in the garden, and giving himself to be the bread and the wine of the new covenant. On Friday, we remembered the cross. You know, that's a day that a lot of us try to just rush through. Right? We, we, what has become the refrain of Good Friday? Sunday's coming. Right? We, we, don't, we don't really want to touch Friday, if we're really honest. We want to be glad that it happened, but we want to move on from it. We don't want to sit in it. We don't want to think about it. We just want to rejoice at what it did for us, rather than understanding what actually happened in those moments. But Friday is meant to be a day to remember Jesus' agony. Maybe sin would not be so easy to enter into if we forced ourselves to focus on the price that Jesus paid for it. And I don't even mean to focus on the physical suffering. I also think we overdo some of that, just trying to concentrate on how much it hurt his body. And that is important, but I think we need to focus on the reality that he who knew no sin became sin for our sake, that we might become the righteousness of God. We need to hear Jesus from the cross cry out in intense pain, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. We need to see him comfort the thief next to him, saying, today you will be with me in paradise only because he was dying for that man's sin. I believe we need to watch as Jesus in his darkest moments abounds in compassion and takes care of his mother. Saying to her and to John, behold your son, behold your mother. We're not supposed to rush past the three hours of darkness. And I know that some of us don't want to hear this and some of us won't even believe it, but sometimes we're not supposed to look for a light at the end of the tunnel. We're just supposed to sit in the darkness. Sometimes we're supposed to see God when nothing else can be seen. You know, the scriptures tell us that when God made his covenant with Abram, it's in Genesis chapter 15, it says that there was dreadful and great darkness. When God was making a world-changing promise, he made it dark because he didn't want Abram to be distracted by anything else that was going on around him. When Saul of Tarsus was met by Jesus on the road to Damascus, it tells us that first he saw a great light, but then he was blinded. He was struck with darkness when he met the Savior of the world. As Jesus was dying for the sin of all humanity, the sun stopped shining. Right, like we talk about how the, how the sun stood still for Joshua. When Jesus was lifted up, the sun sat down, right? There was this moment that when the one who hung the sun was hung, the sun said, I can't stand next to him. I, I don't deserve to be here next to him. It shouldn't be me who lights him. It should be him whose light everyone else is seeing. We can't move past these things quickly. The literal, the literal land was covered in darkness for three hours. There's something in the darkness to be seen. If all we do is try to get out of it, we'll never receive what God intended for us in it. Let's not be afraid to sit in the darkness of the cross just because we know Sunday's coming. Just because you know Sunday's coming doesn't mean Friday's not real. Doesn't mean that all of its intensity is somehow shifted to another day. Scripture says that when the darkness lifted, that Jesus shouted with a loud voice, A lie, a lie, lema sabachthani. In English, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Noah just explained it really well and read the whole passage for us. We need to hear Jesus shout this. We need to hear him quoting Psalm 22, verse 1, quoting Scripture in his darkest hour. Right now, and that's not always new. Some of us, when things get dark, we quote scripture. But how about this? When things get dark, is it scripture that comes out of us? Because a lot of times we quote scripture trying to change things. We quote scripture trying to get the lights to come back on. But is there this reality that when the world caves in on me, scripture is what comes out of me? When I get pressed, when I get squeezed, is it the word of God that comes out? Or is it all that other stuff that doesn't even belong? 
Jesus is quoting scripture in his darkest hour because what we really need to see is that this is humanity's darkest hour. He's dying for us, which is beautiful. But don't miss this. He's dying because of us, which should not create guilt, but it should make sin detestable. Right? We shouldn't feel shame and guilt over our sin, but there should be something in us that says, if that's what sin costs, I don't want any part of it. If that's what sin costs, I won't go near it again. If that's what sin did to Jesus, then I won't make room for sin. I won't let it in my mouth. I won't let it in my ears. I won't let it in my eyes or my mind. I won't allow it in my house or in my family. If that's what sin costs, then I don't want any part of sin. But if we rush past it, we make room for it. When we're willing to sit with the cross, to hear Jesus cry out in exhaustion, I thirst, to hear him with some of his last breath say, it is finished, and to see him say, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit and die, it's supposed to stop us, not push us. We're not supposed to try to figure out what happens next. We're supposed to sit in what just happened. You almost have this feeling of the apostles looking at each other and saying, what just happened? Because I believe that even if they had any measure of faith, what they were hoping is he'd come down. What they were hoping is that this wouldn't happen. What he was hoping that somehow, some way, God would intervene and it would keep this from happening. And so when they took Jesus, when, when Jesus' lifeless body was brought off the cross, I believe that those who had been following him had to look around and say, what, what just happened here? See, if we skip ahead to Sunday, we'll be a people who try to celebrate the joy of the resurrection without feeling the cost of the cross. And if I can be really honest with us tonight, that's why some of us aren't living resurrected lives. Because we want the gift of forgiveness without being willing to sit in the price that was paid for it. We keep trying to talk about what the cross gave us. But before we can receive the gift, we must see what the cross cost Jesus. So tonight it's Saturday, and I'll be honest, like, the days are all off, right? Like, just throw all that away. He probably didn't die on a Friday, so that means, because how is he into the grave three days if he died on Friday and rose on Sunday? No matter how good or bad you are at math, it doesn't work. And if we just look at the Jewish calendar, he died somewhere in the middle of the week and was in the grave three days because Sabbath isn't only Friday to Saturday. Sabbath is also part of the, of the Passover. So when Passover comes, there are multiple Sabbaths within the week. I'll let David Cohen take care of all that, but you know what I'm saying. But for the Holy Week, for, for how we celebrate, and there's nothing wrong with that, Romans 13 makes it really clear that there is room for these things, and we are to be respectful about what it, the Scriptures call, um, just ran right out of my head, disputable, thank you, disputable matters. But according to Holy Week, today is Holy Saturday, or Silent Saturday, or Somber Saturday. It's the day when Jesus' absence was tangible. So if we think about this day the way we're supposed to think about Good Friday, this was the day where all hope seemed lost. This was the day that the Messiah was now not dying, he's dead. The apostles were heartbroken and afraid. They were discouraged and disappointed. They didn't believe in the resurrection yet. So all they had felt like it was gone. Somehow and for some reason, they needed these three days. Otherwise, Jesus would have died and resurrected immediately. So I'm going to tell you this. Somehow, some way, we need these three days. Somehow, some way, we need to sit in these places and not rush to what we got from him, but sit in what he gave Isaiah 53 says he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. We cannot know the depths of his love if we rush past the reality of his pain. We're supposed to be uncomfortable on Good Friday and Silent Saturday. We're supposed to feel the weight of the cross. We're supposed to, as Hebrews 3 says, focus on Jesus. Even when focusing on him makes our hearts uncomfortable. Hebrews chapter 3 teaches us something that I've far too often overlooked. It teaches us to focus on Jesus by examining our hearts. 
Quoting Psalm 95, verse 7, it says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. And then when we get to verse 12, it says, Take care, which can also be translated, Beware, watch, or look out for. So take care, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. We focus on Jesus by taking care of our hearts. It's not about singing songs. Not about coming to church. It's not about the checklist. It's not about reading the reading plan. It's about tending to our heart. This passage of Hebrews 3 uses a large quotation from Psalm 95. We spent a lot of time on it last week, so I'm going to breeze through it this week. That passage says that Israel in the desert hardened their hearts by putting God to the test when they came to Meribah and Massa and they didn't have any water. They panicked, they complained, they quarreled, and they worried. They doubted, and it says they hardened their hearts all because they didn't have water. Which, let's not act like that's not a big deal. Now, it's not, it's not as big of a deal as they made it out to be, but let's not act like it doesn't matter at all, right? Science tells us that under average conditions, you can only survive without water for about three days. So I'm not trying to say that there wasn't a reason for concern, but how we react in those moments tells us the truth about who we are, and it tells us the truth about what we believe about God. Israel had been rescued from Egypt. They had walked through the Red Sea on dry land. They were eating manna while they were complaining about not having water. And they were literally following the cloud of God's presence. But the scripture says that when they ran out of water, they weren't just concerned or afraid or worried. The scriptures say they did not believe and they hardened their hearts. Jump ahead if you've got it open to verse 19. Here's what the scriptures say about that generation that came out of Egypt. That generation that probably saw more miracles than any generation had ever seen before or since. Here's what it says about them. So we see that they were unable to enter the rest of God because of unbelief. How could they not believe? If anybody believes, it's them, right? If anybody should have believed, it's got to be them. How do they not believe? So let me ask this tonight. What if God defines unbelief differently than we do? What if unbelief isn't saying, or excuse me, what if belief isn't saying, I believe in Jesus? What if it's trusting him? What if belief is not theological? What if it's not understanding the doctrines of the Godhead, the incarnation or the end times? What if it's simply believing in God's character, believing in God's person and in his care for us? What if unbelief is simply when we don't trust that God is good? What if that's what he calls unbelief? We classify believers and unbelievers. What if God classifies believers and unbelievers as those who actually trust me and those who don't? That actually makes all of us tremble a little bit, right? Because what it means is I can believe in my head and God can say you don't believe at all. See, the Greek word that's translated unbelief in verse 12 and verse 19 literally means faithfulness, disbelief. Excuse me, unbelief means faithlessness, disbelief, unfaithfulness, or disobedience. It's a word that is talking about how we live, not what we know. Maybe better said, how we live because of what we know. And the word is only used 12 times in the New Testament. As much as we talk about unbelief, you'd think that it was everywhere. It's only used 12 times in the entire New Testament. It's used twice to describe the interaction between Jesus and the disciples and the father with the demon-possessed son. In Matthew, Jesus told the disciples that they hadn't cast out the demon because of their unbelief. And then in Mark, it, the father asked Jesus to help with his unbelief. Let's take a minute, because that's a familiar interaction, but I want us to really think about it. The father was desperate, right? His son had been possessed, it sounds like, for most of his life. The demon had been trying to kill the boy for years, but God had preserved him. The father believed in what he had heard about Jesus enough to bring his son, asking him, if you can do anything, help us. Jesus responded, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. And the man then says, I believe, help my unbelief. The man didn't need faith, he needed trust. He had done the work of getting to Jesus. 
He believed Jesus could. He believed Jesus was able, but he was still unsure of Jesus' goodness. See, goodness is what makes you believe he'll do it for me. Goodness is what makes you believe he cares about me. He knows me. He's concerned with me. He knows me. His hand is on me. I am on his mind and I am in his heart. That's what goodness is. Belief is I know you can. Goodness is I believe in you. The man didn't need faith. He needed trust. Personally, I think that's where some of us live. We've done the work to do what we think we need to do to get God to do what we want him to do. But at the same time, we live nervous that God might not do what we need. We live nervous that the other shoe might drop, that things might not go our way. We don't trust God's goodness. See, the beautiful thing about that interaction is that the man recognized it in his heart as unbelief. He's the one. Jesus didn't say, you need help with your unbelief. As soon as Jesus said, anything is possible for him who believes, the man said, help my unbelief. I believe, I believed enough to get here, but I don't believe enough yet to get to you. Man, I think some of us are teetering on that edge. Like, we believe enough to go to church. We believe enough to ask him into our hearts. We believe enough to stop this or stop that. But we don't believe enough to put our lives in his hand. We don't believe enough to completely surrender, to trust that he is good and his love endures forever. So we're still afraid that we're going to make a misstep and it's all going to fall apart. That we're going to do something wrong and never get what God had for us. That we're going to say the wrong thing and bring something down on ourselves. That we're going to claim something that God never wanted us to have. That's all saying God's not good. I've got to be good for God. But if I really believe in the goodness of God, I come to him because he will care for me. Even if I fall short of him, he will care for me. This man recognized in his, that in, in his heart is unbelief, and I think we need to recognize it as well, and I think we need to start calling it what it is. I think we need to stop softening it, softening it because everything we soften, we accept and we excuse. We can't make room for unbelief. It will harden our hearts, and the only answer for unbelief is confession and repentance. Let's stick with that word for a minute. The same Greek word is used twice to describe how the people in Nazareth, which was Jesus' hometown, reacted to him once his ministry began. Matthew and Mark both say that when Jesus taught in the synagogue of Nazareth, the synagogue that was probably the one that he grew up in, the synagogue where the people, his neighbors and friends, were astonished. They, they recognized his authority, his wisdom. They even recognized his mighty works, but they took offense at him because he was familiar. Right? It says they were astonished at his wisdom. They were astonished at his miracles. But then they said, but isn't this Joseph and Mary's son? And the scripture says that because of the offense they took, he didn't do many mighty works there. And it says it's because of their unbelief. Here's what I want us to see. They acknowledged his work and his wisdom, but they wouldn't trust him because of familiarity. They wouldn't trust him because they never thought the Messiah was going to be their neighbor. They never thought that the Messiah would be someone like them. Maybe they thought that the Messiah would never be someone they thought was beneath them. Let me just, let's, let's work on this a little bit. How many things is God doing in our lives right now that we're rejecting or overlooking because they're not what we expected? They're not what we wanted. They're not what we value. They're not what we thought we deserved. How many things are we saying, no, God can't work that way when God clearly is working the way that he wants to work? That's unbelief. It's unbelief. It keeps us from rest. It keeps us from trust. It keeps us from God. He is God. We are not. We have to let him work the way he knows we, he desires and we need him to work. Mark 16 uses this word to describe why Jesus rebuked the apostles after their re resurrection. He says that he upbraided them for their unbelief. Paul used this word once to describe himself before he met Christ. And then the other six times that it's used all describe Israel. So here's what I need us to see tonight. All 12 times that the word unbelief is used in the New Testament, it's describing people that we would call believers. All 12 times that it uses the word unbelief in the New Testament, it's used to describe people that were with God, that were following God, that were marveling at God, or even belonged to God. 
This should sound an alarm in us. It should tell us that belief is not knowing that he is God, but believing that he is good. See, believers follow him and they yield to him because believers trust him. According to Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12, we have to stand guard against the places in our hearts that don't trust God. Because if we don't, those places will lead us to fall away from God. We have to deal with our hearts. This is what Hebrews 3 is warning us of and pointing back to. In Exodus 17, Psalm 78, and Psalm 95, we're told about the generation that came out of Egypt. It says that they hardened their hearts when they ran out of water. And after that, we see that they fell away from God. Right? They ran out of water. This was early when they ran out of water. This was early when they, this was a few weeks into the journey. They'd already seen miracle after miracle after miracle. But when they didn't have water, the scriptures say that they hardened their hearts. And then as we read the story, we watch them fall away from God. They ended up complaining about everything. We went on it. We talked about this last week. I've got to go back to it. Complaining is a sign that your heart is on its way to being hardened. If you are a complainer, your heart is hard. That's what it's trying to tell you. We need to guard our hearts and we need to listen to ourselves. If it's easy for me to complain, there's something wrong with my heart. And we need to wrestle with that. Instead of explaining it and excusing it, we should be trembling in those places. If God says, do all things without grumbling and complaining, why do I make room for grumbling and complaining? Why do I excuse it and explain it? Instead of saying, you know what? Maybe this, maybe it's not that God hates it. Maybe it's bad for me. Maybe it's not that God's saying, you know what? I hate complaining. Don't do it. It's God saying, if you keep doing that, you will drift away from me. It's God saying, this is breaking our relationship. If he spoke in those terms, would we, li would we listen better? Would we act differently? But if we actually study the scripture, those are the terms he's speaking in. It's exactly what he's trying to tell us, what he, what he desires that we would grab hold of and understand. Israel complained about everything. Then they built a golden calf and worshipped another god. They refused to go into the promised land. And what does it say? They died in the wilderness. And it all started with water. It all started in their hearts when they didn't trust God's goodness. So I'll ask us tonight, have our hearts become hardened by distrust? Have we drifted away as Hebrews 2 warns? Are we right now neglecting such a great salvation because things haven't gone the way we expected? Here's the hard thing. Once we start drifting, we're never going to get back by trying harder. We're not going to get back by reading more or praying more or going to church more often or getting involved in ministry. We will only get back by dealing with our hearts. We'll only get back by confession, repentance, humility, and surrender. Are there still unsurrendered places in us tonight? Someone has said it for themselves. I'll say it for all of us. Yes. No matter who you are, no matter how well I know you or don't know you, the truth is this. There are still unsurrendered places in all of our hearts. The question that matters is, are we willing to deal with them? Are we willing to trust God? Are we willing to believe that Jesus is greater than our unbelief? That he's better than our unbelief? Because if we believe that, we must then ask him to teach us how to trust him. Because trust doesn't come naturally, but it also doesn't come by effort. I can't trust God by telling myself to trust him. I need him to, to lead me to trust. And you know how he will lead? Surrender. Trust will be let it go. Trust will be walk away. Trust will be stop grabbing, stop clinging, stop demanding, stop wanting. Trust will be whatever you decide. Trust will be, I must decrease, he must increase. Trust will be, <laughs> trust will be Job saying, even if he slay me, I will not curse him. But what exactly does trusting God look like? Let's go to a familiar verse, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. Most of you don't even need to turn there. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. The Hebrew word that we translate trust in this passage is batak. Its literal meaning is to go quickly to for refuge. So to trust God is to go quickly to him for help. That's when I trust God. 
when I go quickly to him for help. But as you study this word, it's interesting. It's not a word about belief. It's a word of hope. Because it's not just what we believe, but how our belief affects how we feel and how we live. This word actually means to live at ease because of our confidence in God. So here's the hard one tonight. How many of us are living at ease? Right now, and what's going on in your life, and what's going on at work, what's going on with your kids, what's going on in your body, how many of us are living at ease? Because I'm going to be honest, I'm not. I'm up late way too many nights. I'm letting things work in my brain way more than they need to. I'm trying to fix everybody else's issues. I'm worried about what happens if I don't fix their issues. I am not living at ease. And you know what that means? I am not trusting in the Lord with all my heart. And he gives us these things. He gives us his scripture. And it's not just things to memorize and quote. There's things to be changed by. Which means that if I really want to know, am I trusting God? All I've got to do is look at my life. All I've got to do is measure my heart rate. All I've got to do is see my sleep patterns. That will start telling me, am I trusting God? And some of us will push back and we'll say, well, you know, I'm just a weary or I've always been anxious or, you know, it really is a serious situation or it's this or it's that. Are you at ease or not? Because if that's what the word means that the scriptures have called us to, that's how I have to learn how to measure myself. Trust is the action that produces peace, right? We want peace to be something that comes from God. I want it to be this warm blanket that falls down from heaven and wraps me up. That's why we pray all the time. God, give me peace. Give me peace. Give me peace. What if if you and I would learn to trust peace would rise within us rather than coming down upon us? What if that's what peace actually is? What if it's greater than our understanding because it's all it is is me saying, I believe God will. I believe God is. I believe God's good. I don't understand it. I thought he would do this and he didn't, but he's good. I'm learning to live at ease. That will lead me to live in peace. See, Trusting God is taking hold of what we know when we find ourselves in uncertain circumstances and seasons. It's the three Hebrew boys saying our God is able to deliver us. So they believed in faith, but then they also had hope. But even if he doesn't, Even if he doesn't, we know who he is. We're not bowing down. It's Paul writing from prison, awaiting death, saying, I know in whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what I have entrusted to him. It's Abraham offering up Isaac for one reason only. As Hebrews 11 says, he was certain that God was able to raise him from the dead. It's Paul and Silas refusing to leave the jail when the gates opened. And when the chains fell off of them, why? Because they knew that we were here by the will of God. We don't need to go running away because a miracle opened the doors. It's Jesus standing before Pilate and telling him, you would have no authority unless it was given from heaven. It's Jesus hanging on the cross and praying, Father, forgive them. It's being sure of God when we are not sure of anything else. I believe trust is what Romans 12.1 is describing when it pleads with us to live in view of God's mercy. It's believing in who God is so deeply that we rest in his character rather than running with our worries. If that's what trust is, I'll ask us again, do we trust God? Are we living at ease? Or do we have a ways to go? Hebrews 3.12 says, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. How? How are we supposed to do this? How do we take care of our hearts? How do we deal with unbelief when we find it? How do we guard against falling away from God? Verse 13 says this, but exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. I think for too long, we have separated these two things like they have nothing to do with each other. Do not harden your hearts, but encourage each other, not recognizing that the but means they're connected. The conjunction, means, the conjunction means they're connected to each other. So when, when the author is saying, do not harden your hearts, when he says, but, he's about to tell you how. And yet we separate them and we use them like two separate things. Is the author actually exhorting, saying that exhorting each other is how we guard our hearts? Has to be. Which you know, and, and John Piper says it this way, and I absolutely love it. He says, this means that our eternal security in Christ is a group project. And no one likes group projects, right? Because there's always somebody that doesn't do any of the work and gets the, and gets all the, and gets the same grade as me. And, but the interesting thing is I've never met someone that has ever said, I'm the one who doesn't do the work. 
Everyone I've ever met is like, you know what? I'm always the one that does all of the work. Everybody I know. So either I'm surrounded by high achievers or we all lie about the whole thing. But eternal security in Christ is a group project. It requires community. So let's be reminded of who the original readers were. These are, Paul is writing, or not Paul, excuse me, the author, I say Paul so much that it just came out. The author is writing to Jewish believers, here we are again, believers being told to be careful of unbelief. That doesn't make sense to us because we don't understand unbelief in the eyes of God. Jewish believers who were dealing with persecution and they were weary, they were discouraged and disappointed, and they were considering going back to Judaism without Jesus. They were considering going back to the angels and the sacrificial system, the priests and the law and the old covenant. That's why the point that's being made over and over in this letter is simply Jesus is better. Right? He's better than the angels. He's better than the law. He's better than Moses. We're going to keep going. He'll be better than the prophets and better than the sacrifices and better than the priests. Anything that you could think of in the old covenant, he's better than all of those things. But there is also a second point that is woven in to this entire letter, and it is this. Jesus is better, and we need each other. Because sometimes the only way to recognize that Jesus is better is in relationship with each other. Sometimes we're too close to see it. Sometimes we're too hard-hearted to see it. We've already hardened our hearts, and we, we refuse. We, we neglect. We reject. And so the only way sometimes to see that Jesus is better than what I'm going through is to be in community with Jesus' people. The author is telling people in need of exhortation, and this is, this is hard. The author is telling people in need of exhortation that they need to be exhorters. He's telling people in need of encouragement they need to go be encouragers. He's telling people in need of help that they need to go help others. He's telling them that the greatest way to be built up is to become a builder. Right? In, in, our, in our natural lives, we say things like, if you want friends, you need to be friendly. I've taught my sons that if you want res to be respected, you have to be respectful. Why wouldn't this translate into other areas of our lives, especially our spiritual lives? If you want to be loved, be loving. If you want to be forgiven, be forgiving. If you don't want to be judged, don't allow yourself to be judgmental. If you want to be treated kindly, be kind. If you want to be invited over, start inviting people to your place. If you want to be treated generously, become a generous person. That's what the scriptures are saying. He's, remember, he's telling people in need of encouragement, you need to encourage each other. They're sitting there reading this going, you were supposed to encourage us. And he's saying, that's not how this works. In the kingdom of God, everything is upside down because you've been living wrong side up for a long time. See, we were never meant to be partakers from God. We were supposed to be partners with God. Our hearts were not meant to be followed, but to be led. We drift from our great salvation when we allow ourselves to drift in our great emotions. And I'm not trying to say that we shouldn't feel them or that they're bad. There are times when we need to mourn, when we need to grieve, when we need to be angry. There are times when we deserve to be disappointed or discouraged. There are seasons where concern is warranted, where our trouble is real. But let me ask this respectfully tonight. Aren't we tired of living in those places? Aren't we tired of instead of passing through, setting up camp? Because that's what happens to a lot of us. Our big emotions end up being where we live. We don't know how to keep pressing. We decide, if I feel this way, I deserve to feel this way, I'm going to keep feeling this way until somehow I don't feel this way, not knowing you got to keep moving. You ever noticed that in college towns, there are a lot of people that went to college and never left? I don't mean they're still enrolled in school. I just mean they just, they moved. They, they lived there. I went to school in Phoenixville. I'm amazed at how many people I went to school with live in Phoenixville now. Like that became their home. And for me, the idea was I was going there four years, getting my degree, and I was moving on. I, I don't even like visiting the place. So I don't understand how people live there. And yet emotionally, that's how a lot of us live. We start, got stunted and we stopped when anxiety got to its height. We stopped when our grief got its worst. We stopped when our anger reached its ceiling. We came there and decided something has to change this, not believing that you can be changed if you learn how to keep moving. These are not places, we've said this before, we've said it for years, we have a tendency to build houses where we were only meant to pitch tents. The emotions are real and the emotions are necessary. I'll even go this far. The emotions are good. But they're not meant to be in charge. 
See, it's unbelief that takes us from feeling anxiety to being anxious people. And that's what's happening is we're not trusting God in these really hard places. We're just waiting for it to change rather than believing that he's good. Because a lot of us don't believe that he can be good in places like this. We've decided that if he was good, I wouldn't go through this. If he was good, this wouldn't be happening. If he was good, I wouldn't have to face this. Instead of real, reminding ourselves, he is good, I will find him in this. I will see him in the darkness. I will grab hold of him in places I did not want to be. He will show me his goodness because I'm believing that he's here and I'm believing that he's good. It's unbelief that takes us from being disappointed to living in disappointment. It's unbelief that takes us from mourning to bitterness. It's unbelief that turns our hearts from the living God, but somehow it's exhortation that leads our hearts to God in the midst of our difficulty. So what does it mean to exhort? Because that's kind of an old-fashioned King James word. A lot of translations have moved from exhort one another every day to encourage one another daily. Because exhort is just thought of as verbal. Exhorting is what I'm doing here tonight. What we're being called to is bigger than that. So while I think the change in translation is good, I don't think it's good enough. Because again, we tend to think of encouragement as motivation. It's a pat on the back, a gentle word that tells us we're doing well or that it will be all right. Or even that says it's okay to feel the way that you do. And hear me, there's a place for all of that. It's valuable and it's needed. But hear me also, it's not transformational. I've never been changed by having someone tell me it was okay to feel the way I felt. Never been changed by it. Because that's not supposed to be the end of the conversation. That conversation is supposed to be keep going. It's supposed to be for a friend that loves me enough to say it's okay to feel the way you do, but it's not okay that you stay here. It's okay that this is happening, but God's doing more than this. God's better than this. We've got to keep going. We don't like being pushed. I don't think that this is the kind of encouragement that Hebrews 3 is calling us to. The Greek word we translate as exhort or encourage is used often. It's used 108 times in 104 verses of the New Testament. That means it must be pretty important, right? Unbelief is there 12 times. Encouragement is used 108 times. Something we need to, we need to start weighing things this way. It's important. It's supposed to be a part of who we are as individuals, but also who we are as a community. The word literally means to call near or to call to one side. So it's not telling me it's everything's going to be okay. It's telling me, come walk with me. Come sit with me. Come, let's do this together. We guard our hearts by walking together. We protect ourselves from drifting when we hem each other in. We can't fall away if we're holding each other up. But here's where I think we need help. The time we need to be the most encouraging is when we need encouragement ourselves. The time that we need to be the most helpful is when we are in need of help. The time when we need to be the most kind is when we need kindness. The time we need to be the most present is when we feel our loneliest. Because here's the thing that I've learned in my own life, that if you're waiting for someone to fix you, there is not enough good they can do. We've all known somebody that you could not do enough for them, right? We've all had somebody that we may not have said it out loud, but we said it inside. You are hard to please. There's a reason for that. And I'm going to be honest, I've been that person. Hard to please. I've been that person that, with my arms crossed saying, well, we'll see. We'll see if this is good or not. We'll see if this fixes it or not. We'll see if it gets better or not. That comes from not trusting in God's goodness. But it also comes from believing that other people are in charge of my emotions. A believing that if they would do it right, I wouldn't feel this way any longer. And yet what the scriptures are showing us is when you feel your lowest, lift somebody else up. When you're wavering, hold somebody. When you can't find it in you, give it to somebody else. The greatest act of trust might be when we give to each other from our places of need. So here's where we start to, this isn't closing, don't get excited, but it's where we start to, it's where we start to bring it all together. Because my kids tell me that I close three or four times every week. 
This weekend, we gather to celebrate the exhortation of Jesus. And that's not his sermons. It's his life. He came alongside us, and then he called us to his side. As he was re preparing himself for death, he washed the apostles' feet. As he knew he was about to be betrayed, he served them the Passover meal and gave them his body and his blood. As his soul was troubled over Judas' betrayal, he encouraged Peter, telling him that when he prayed, that he had prayed for him, and when he returned after denying him, that he was to encourage his brothers. When he was praying in the garden, he turned from himself to the apostles, and he even turned toward us. Have we ever really read John 17 in the right context? Because we act like the, the, the prayer in the garden in John 17 happened some other day than when he, when he was wrestling, saying, not my will, but thine be done. It's the same prayer. It's the same passage. It's just John telling us about Jesus' heart for us in the middle of Jesus' own internal calamity. When he was in the garden, when his soul was troubled, when he's sweating blood, that he was praying so hard that his angels had to come and feed him after it was over, while he was drinking the cup of judgment, and in the middle of it, he stopped and prayed for us. He interceded for you and for me when he needed intercession. That's exhortation. That's what we, who our God is, but it's who we're called to be. He trusted the Father to take care of his heart, and so he turned his heart to take care of ours. Ever gone and visited somebody at the hospital and left feeling like they had ministered more to you than you had to them? Ever have somebody give to you knowing they couldn't afford it? Man, we, we've got to learn this. We've got to learn this. We've got to learn this because the reality is the church in our community often is living from hard hearts rather than living for the hard hearts of those around us. Jesus is our great exhorter. All of this he did, and that's just, that's just the Thursday night. Then there's the cross. He who knew no sin became sin for our sake that we might become the righteousness of God. On the cross, as he was bearing sin, as he was becoming the sin of the world, he prayed for the forgiveness of all the sinners that put him there. And that's not the Romans and the Jews. That's all of us. That's everyone from Adam and Eve till the end of time. Everyone who ever sinned, he died once for all. So when he said, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. He was talking about your sin and my sin and our kids' sin and their kids' sin. And if he tarries, another generation and another generation. He was praying for all of us because he was paying for all of us. He gave salvation to a man he was dying for. He took care of his mother's heart and her future. He quoted scripture and revealed his identity yet again for those who were standing there willfully blind. He paid our debt. He came alongside us in sin without ever joining us by sinning. He took on every sin of the world. We were already condemned and he entered into our condemnation. He died our death. He spent three days in the grave in Sheol, as the Old Testament calls it. He didn't just dip his toe into death. He entered it because the only way to rescue us from it was to go down and defeat it. Ephesians 4, 9 says that he descended into the lower parts of the earth and that he could not have ascended until, unless he had descended. Jesus paid it all means so much more than we think it does. There's a lot we don't understand. There's a lot of theology that goes into all of this. And all theology is, is our best guess most of the time. So I'll be honest. Somebody asked me last night, what happened during those three days? I don't have any idea. None whatsoever and not enough that I would preach. But I know what the scripture says. I know that Peter says that somehow, some way, he went and pre preached to those who were in prison. I know that what Ephesians says that he went down to the middle parts, the de deep parts of the, of the earth. I don't know what any of that means, but I know that he did it. And I know that he paid it all means more than I think that it means. His price was so much more than a crown of thorns and a beating and death. It was so much more than a few hours of physical torture. He came alongside us. But as we celebrate tomorrow, he didn't just die. He arose. He became sin. He absorbed the wrath of God. He defeated death and hell. He came alongside us in sin. And then he arose and called us to now come alongside him in redemption. Now, he says, now you can be holy even as I am holy. Now you can be conformed to my image. Now you can be called the children of God. See, because Jesus died, we are free from our sin. But because he arose, we must go and sin no more. 
Because Jesus died, we can believe that we are loved by God, but because He arose, we must love God with all of our heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength. And a big part of loving God is trusting His goodness. And believing in that, if He's done this for us, right? Like, let's go back to Egypt. Let's go back to Israel again. If He did that for us, He'll give us water. Guys, if he died for your sin, he'll take care of your bills. If he died for your sin, he'll take care of your body. If he died for your sin, he'll, he'll, he'll draw your children. If he died for your sin, he'll do whatever he needs to do for him to be glorified and for us to experience his goodness. And so when our hearts try to deceive us, when our feelings try to overwhelm us, when our circumstances try to control us, we have to tell ourselves and tell each other, the Lord is good and his steadfast love endures forever. Man, we got to learn how to speak scripture better. Man, we have these long conversations where scripture hardly ever even gets quoted or mentioned. We talk about how we feel and our advice and our ideas. There's got to be a place where we become a people of the word, right? Like we're learning how to have conversations around the word. We're learning how to make the scriptures the center. Well, that means they have to become the center of our friendships and our conversations as well, right? There's got to be a point where when my heart is troubled, somebody comes alongside me and simply says to me, but God has demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. There's got to be a place where we as the people of God can gather around each other in our worst moments, in our worst hours where our hearts are reeling and be able to simply say in truth and you were dead in your trespasses and sins but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in our trespasses made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved and he's raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus there's got to be a place where what Jesus has done settles us into what he's doing in the desert, Israel needed to exhort each other. They needed to come alongside each other. They needed to declare God's wonders in the midst of their thirst, in the midst of their lack. They needed to trust that God, the God who led them out of Egypt was too good to lead them to die of thirst. And so tonight, I exhort you, trust God. Believe in His goodness. Focus on Jesus. Deal with your heart and let's walk together. Live in the love demonstrated at the cross. Live in the power demonstrated in the resurrection. Live in the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Live from the new heart, not the old one. Live in newness of life, not the old feelings, habits, and unhealthy relationships. Live with Jesus, live for Jesus, and live like Jesus. And that all begins with confession. And so tonight, let's confess and repent of our unbelief. Let's let him search our hearts instead of closing our hearts up. Because the only way that we're ever going to enter into the rest of trusting God is confessing all the places we don't trust him yet. And Ed always says it when we talk about salvation, those who don't believe yet. So I'm going to say it tonight this way, the places we don't trust him yet. It's not an accusation. It just means there's work to be done. It just means there's places that he's still ready to take full control of. Let's deal with our hearts and let's exhort each other. Because I believe that's how we trust God and that's how we believe that Jesus is better than our unbelief. Would you stand with me please tonight? So we may as well be uncomfortable on a silent, somber Saturday, since we do it on a lot of regular old Saturdays. But we need to exhort each other. We need to encourage each other tonight. And so if you're willing tonight, I'm going to ask you, just find somebody and ask them to pray for your unbelief. If there's places you need to confess, Find somebody and confess. There's places where you know, I don't trust God with my job at all right now. Go tell somebody that. Ask them to pray. Maybe they're deeper. Maybe they're harder to, to, to articulate. Then just tell them, I got places I don't trust. I need help. But if we can allow the scriptures to tell us that the difference between falling away from God and entering the rest of God is encouraging each other, how can we let a little discomfort 
calls us to leave without obeying the scriptures. And so whether it's somebody you're comfortable with, somebody that you came here with, or whether you know tonight, you know what, I got to dive into this discomfort all the way. Would you go find somebody and would you just confess places of unbelief and pray for each other and just simply pray this, pray to believe, pray for the courage to trust in the goodness of God. Take a few minutes, we'll pray, and then I'll come back with a benediction.
Thank you. Heavenly Father, thank you tonight that you search us and you know us. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who lives in us, not just to empower us to do ministry, but to empower us to surrender to your goodness. And so, Lord, I pray tonight that we would let you have your way in our hearts. We join the father of that young boy and say, help our unbelief. We, God, tonight, we're not going to hide it. God, I speak for myself, and I pray that my, my brothers and sisters will join me. God, I'm not going to hide it anymore. I'm not going to excuse it. I'm not going to not make room for it. I'm going to call it what it is. It's unbelief. And the only way to be free of it is to acknowledge it. And so tonight, help me. Teach me to trust you. Teach me to trust you. God, tonight, just search all of our hearts. And I pray that we would sit with you, that before we go celebrate the resurrection, that we would empty ourselves of all of the unbelieving places in our lives. God, I'm just going to do it with my brothers and sisters tonight. God, I, I don't trust you with the building often enough. God, I don't trust you with this whole house renovation we're about to go through. I don't trust you with the health of some of the people I love. God, there's just too many places that I keep grabbing and they don't belong to me. And too many places that I keep trying to excuse and explain and you keep trying to show me you don't trust me. And so God, forgive me tonight. Cleanse me tonight of all of my unrighteousness and teach me to trust you. And I am well aware that that means we're headed into some difficult places. I am well aware that trust is like patience. The only way you can learn it is to need it. And so I just ask you, lead me. Lead me in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. And take every wicked, unbelieving place out of my heart. And God, I do pray tonight as we close that... Um, that it would alarm us that you put evil and unbelieving together. That it would alarm us that in Hebrews 3, that, that you tell us to be careful not to have an evil, unbelieving heart. Forgive me for not seeing unbelief for what it is. It's not just that I need to trust you. I want to trust you. I want to rest in you. I want the peace that doesn't come from above the peace that comes from within because I'm at ease because I know God's in control. And so Lord, as you lead us toward tomorrow morning, may we be willing to sit in the somber so that we're ready to rejoice in the resurrection. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand with me, please? Our benediction tonight is the benediction from the book of Hebrews. It just made sense. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. We get to do this just a little bit earlier than everybody else. He is risen. He is risen Amen. God bless you guys.